Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. The King James text today reads in this fashion. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Amen. If you bow your heads with me a moment this afternoon, let's go to the Lord once again. Master, Savior, soon coming King, we love you, God. Lord, we love you today. We thank you for the Word of God. It is indeed your gift to the church today, a love letter from the Creator to His creation. Master, I humble myself in your presence. I acknowledge as always that outside of the anointing of the Holy Ghost, all I can do is make noise. Lord, the people of God need to hear from heaven today. I need to hear from heaven today. I need you to speak through me, to use me. Lord, is your oracle to deliver a prophetic word to the people of God that they might benefit and be blessed, that their soul might be encouraged, but at the same time, God, that they might be challenged to step up higher, to be better, to do more. Lord, today your people... Oh God, within the church world have a tendency to gravitate toward a message that simply elevates them and causes them to emotionally achieve some high. But God, we need to hear from heaven. We need to be instructed so that we might know the way to walk the way to walk the way to live. Lord, that you might be fully able to unleash your blessing and your power and your benefits in our life. Anoint the speaker today, O oh God, anoint the hearer. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic converted, but not transformed. Many professed Christians exist in our world today who have indeed experienced a conversion. But they have refused to allow the Spirit of God to transform them. Transformation requires that we place our life and all that we are in the hands of the great potter who then remakes and remolds us until we appear more and more like him and less and less like the people of this world. In the 12th chapter of the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul is admonishing, admonishing the church to present our bodies a living sacrifice unto God. You know, it's funny because I know how this is often interpreted. I know how this is often represented. But I think a lot of times people and preachers miss the point. 
in the early church days in the first century the church was going through an awful lot rose the people of God were going through persecution they were being tortured and tormented they were being jailed and beaten they were experiencing things in their body that thank God we have never seen and we have never known as Christians in the 20th and 21st century anyway. But Paul's reminding the church to understand that our bodies ought to be presented to God as a living sacrifice. Therefore, whatever we must go through in this body, this is what Paul's telling the church. It's not about, man, I'll tell you, if I hear one more preacher go immediately to sex, that's the first thing they want to talk about when they talk about this scripture. But Paul is not talking <clears throat> about intimacy. He's not talking about human sexuality. He is talking about the human condition and having to live in a flesh and blood body. And Paul says, in effect, whatever we experience in this body, understand that we're to offer that up to God as a living sacrifice. When we're tormented, when we're tortured, when we're beaten, when we are imprisoned, when we're bound, understand that everything you go through in this body is offered unto God by way of a living sacrifice. I'm going to tell you, believer, many of us today have not been bound. Many of us today have not been imprisoned. Many of us today have not been beaten or tortured. But there are many who are living with sickness. There are many who are living with disease. There are many who are living with conditions that bring pain into our lives. Just this week, uh, I was going through a couple of days where my right elbow was hurting me so badly I could, could hardly stand it. And Rose, it's just arthritis, you know. I'm getting older, I've got to admit it. Tommy doesn't want to admit it. He still <laughs> wants to think he's 25. You know, he looks at me dirty every time I say to him, well, you're getting older. You're getting, he gives me that dirty look as if to say, no, I'm not. Oh, yes, you are. <laughs> and as you're getting older, you've got to acknowledge and you've got to understand things happen in our body as we get older. Wouldn't you know, I come from a family that has more health foolishness uh, in our genes than, than most families do. My great-grandmother, bless her heart, was a saint of God like no other. I'm telling you, she was a marvelous Holy Ghost filled lady. But that precious little thing had arthritis in her hands and in her body that was so bad. And she would get gout in her, I think it was in her knees. And I get gout, I have gout that uh, flames up every once in a while in my ankle, my right ankle. And I'm going to tell you, gout is painful. It's a form of arthritis. It is painful like you can't even believe. It literally feels like someone has, has placed shards of glass between your bone joints. And it's always right in a joint that, you know, you really need to use, whether it be your arm or whether it be your ankle or your knee. And my poor grandmother, you know, she had arthritis in her body so bad that her little fingers were kind of gnarled up a little bit. And yet, Rose, I never heard my little great-grandmother complained. I never heard her talking about how much pain she was in and how much suffering she was going. I don't know how she did it. Of course, somebody watching, especially you ladies, you're thinking, well, it's because you're a man and men can't handle pain. That's why God gave women, uh, you know, childbearing responsibilities because men are lousy with pain. Uh, you know, my elbow was hurting so, I mean, it was hurting so bad you can't even know how bad it was hurting the other day. And I told Tommy, I said, dear God, it's 
long as I leave it straight out like this, I'm okay. But the minute I try to bend it, oh my goodness, the pain that tears through me. I don't understand how my great-grandmother could have so much pain in her little body, and yet she sewed. And yet she cooked. She kept an immaculate house. She made her bed, you know. Uh, she ironed. There wasn't anything in the world my great-grandma that didn't do. And yet she did it with all this pain surging through her body. I don't get it, but I'll tell you what I do know. I do know that what we go through as believers in our body counts when we offer it to God as a living sacrifice. <laughs> Hallelujah. When we say, Lord, whatever's going on in my body, I'm going to serve you anyway. Whatever's going on in my body, I'm going to love you anyway. Whatever's going on in my body, I'm going to worship you anyway. There isn't anything that my old body can throw at me that the devil can toss my way that I'm not going to keep on living for God and serving God and worshiping God. Hallelujah. We offer it unto the Lord as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And the Word of God said this is a reasonable service. This, this isn't, you know, above and beyond what is reasonable. No, this is reasonable. It's reasonable. But listen to what Paul said, because today I'm really not concentrating on verse 1, but rather more on verses 2 and 3. Paul said, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind, not by changing the clothes that hang in your closet, not by cleaning out your jewelry chest. No, Paul said there's a renewal that's necessary for believers. We must be renewed. Where? How must we be renewed? We must be renewed in our mind. We've got to think differently than the world thinks. We've got to see things differently than the world see things, sees things. We've got to evaluate things by a different standard than the world evaluates them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, a passage that is common to most evangelicals, especially today. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. There is a transformation that is supposed to occur when we're born again. There is a transformation that is supposed to occur in the process of our living for God and walking with the Lord. But why is it? So many people that call themselves Christians today still think like the world. Talk to them. And you'll hear the same prejudices you hear in the world. You'll hear the same racism. You'll hear the same homophobia. You'll hear the same fears. You'll yep. hear the same uh, anxieties. My goodness. Well, I, I don't hear a lot of difference in the way they think. I don't hear a lot of difference in the way they look at things and the way they see things. Why is that? Because I'm going to tell you, uh, some of the greatest, most godly Christian people I've ever known, like Brother and Sister Gillum and, uh, you know, many of the pastors I had as a kid and, uh, and people I grew up with in church and so many of the great saints of God at Riverside Church of God. Man, I'm going to tell you, you talk to those people, Tommy, and... There, there was an, it was like almost like they were living on another planet somewhere, like they were in another world somewhere. All they did, it didn't matter who was president, they were okay. It didn't matter what was going on in the world of politics, they were all right. And I mean, they had a positive outlook. They had a faith-filled outlook. They were always looking to the Lord. You know, the first words off their mouths weren't, well, that stinking Obama. <laughs> 
first words off their mouth were, oh, isn't Jesus wonderful? Isn't it wonderful to know the Lord? And I mean literally, I came down from Connecticut to Texas at the age of 16 years old, and I began to attend the uh, Riverside Church of God, and my goodness, I, I found things to be so different than the church I grew up in, because I grew up in the Assemblies of God, and the Assemblies of God, like the Baptist Church, has always love to just dive into politics and talk about politics all the time. And they're constantly trying to affect things and affect change in our world as if it's our world to change. Mm -hmm. No, I'm sorry, but my Bible says Satan is the God of this world. Am I telling the truth? Isn't that what the Word of God says? Yeah. This isn't our world to change. When change occurs, and it's coming, it's going to be not because the Baptist Church did something, not because the Assemblies of God did something, not because Full Gospel Businessmen's Association did something, not because the Gideon Bible Society did something, not because the United Pentecostal Church International did something. Hey, when change comes, it's going to come because Jesus Christ himself will come and it's going to change and you won't be able to stop it. Hallelujah to God. He is going to destroy everything on the face of this planet as we know it by fire. That's what the Word of God tells us. And He is going to remake it. Hallelujah. Oh, it's going to be remade. Listen to me, children. In its original form. Mm. Oh my goodness. The earth is going to be restored. It's not going to be made into something that it never was. No. It's going to be like the believer who is going to be restored to the nature Adam had before the fall. Made in the image and likeness of God. But we're going to be restored as believers, but the earth is going to be restored to its original state. To the state it was in when God first created it. Well, how was it first created? It was created a garden. It was created a place of beauty. It was created a place where there was no danger. There was no toil. There was no struggle. There was no pain. There was nothing that could cause hurt or injury. Oh, I want to tell you, one day God is literally going to remake our entire planet, our entire planet, so that in its entirety, the earth will be a garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. My goodness. We got people in the Christian church today who spend all their time trying to affect change in our world because they have convinced themselves that this is the duty and this is the responsibility of a believer. But children, I've got news for you today. That is a lie. Mm -hmm. If you had gone through the transformation that God would bring you through, so that your mind and your thinking were more like the mind and thinking of Christ. Isn't that what we're supposed to be going for? Isn't that what our aim uh -huh. is supposed to be? To have the mind of Christ. If we had the mind of Christ, we would be focused on our heavenly mission. Oh my goodness. Not an earthly one. Are you hearing me today, children? We would be focused on our heavenly... Well, what is our heavenly mission? Well, first of all, our heavenly mission is to more and more, day by day, try and look more like Jesus. Mm -hmm. Our heavenly mission is to win the lost right. and bring them... You know, it cracks me up. We get all these preachers get on television and carry on about how wonderful this political leader has been, even though the man's a demon. 
Oh, he's doing things that the church wants him to do. He's, he's a puppet for the church. That's what they're really celebrating is that they've got an idiot in the White House. Not now, thank God, but before. They had an idiot who they could manipulate. Because his love for money and his love for power made him easily manipulatable when you had control of a large voting bloc. You got these people that get all caught up in what this guy has done and what he's able to do that these religious leaders are wanting him to do. And they've lost track of their heavenly mission. Because I'd like to know one thing, I'm going to say the name, that Donald Trump did, one thing that advanced the cause of Jesus Christ in the earth one inch. Mm. Nothing. Tell me one thing he did that helped one sinner, one unbeliever to find a place of repentance. Don't stand there and tell me he's a believer. Don't stand there and tell me he's a Christian. You liar. No, a Christian's first, first responsibility is to be a testimony and a witness to a lost and dying world. What did that man ever do that encouraged a single unbeliever, a single one, to want to believe the gospel and be a Christian? Oh, see, but all these political up, all these political ends and all these political goals that religious leaders in America had. He helped us to move the American embassy to Jerusalem. Okay. And uh, who saved today that wasn't saved before that happened? Because it happened. Mm -hmm. Oh, he helped turn the attention of the government against gays and lesbians and against transgender people in the military. Why, bless God. Uh-huh, and let me ask you, how many people are saved today because he did that? Hmm. How many people are saved today because they were so moved and so impressed and so touched by the church's involvement in that foolishness. Oh. If we had the mind of Christ like the Lord Jesus Christ at the age of 12 years old when his mom and Joseph couldn't find him and they finally went back and found him debating in the temple and talking with the religious leaders and the priests and confounding them with his wisdom, they would be like that young Jesus. And they'd say, well, don't you know, I've got to be about my father's business. Hallelujah. I've got to be about my father. I don't have time to get caught up in politics. I don't have time to get caught up in social battles and wars over uh, societal issues. I don't have time to get caught up in all this foolishness because I have a heavenly mission that God has called me to. And that's where I'm focused. But see, in order to focus on a heavenly mission, we've got to have a heavenly mindset. Yes. In order to have a heavenly mindset, Rose, we've got to have a transformed, renewed mind. Amen. Many Pentecostal people today will claim to be transformed because they dress differently. Or they do not do things like they used to do. Or they do things now they didn't used to do. Like go to church, read their Bible, pray, etc. But the way they think is every bit as much dictated by the trends and influences found in our world as any unbeliever. I had a family member that I adore. She's a one God, Jesus name, Pentecostal lady. I adore her to death. I really do. 
Can't get her to wear makeup. Can't get her to wear pants. Can't get her to wear jewelry. Can't get her to cut her hair, bless God. Wears her dresses down well below her knee. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But boy, I'm going to tell you, Rose, when it comes to keeping up with the Joneses, She's right in there. She's right in the race, honey. Oh, she ain't going to let the Joneses pass her out when it comes to pushing her husband to make the almighty dollar so she can buy the expensive dresses. Because see, even though all you wear is dresses versus pants and jeans and all that, uh, there are some folk in the church who can afford to wear the fancy stuff, the expensive stuff, the designer stuff. And then there's those of us, there are those like myself who have to wear the stuff out of the thrift shops. And you got people who call themselves holiness, who call themselves, they brag they're apostolic. Oh, I'm apostolic. I don't cut my hair. I don't wear jewelry. I don't do this. I don't do that. But their thinking and their mindset is so worldly, it is disgusting. They don't think any differently than the world does. The world thinks the more you got, the better off you are. You know what? They put their jobs ahead of their children, just like the world does. And then they wonder why their families are experiencing the same turmoil and the same trouble that families in the world are experiencing. Am I telling the truth today? I know I am. Mm -hmm. Well, it's because you put your job ahead of your kids. When's the last time you went to your son's ball game? When's the last time? You, my own father, when I graduated from middle school, my mother told him for days and days and days, Rose told him over and over again. Now CJ graduated from middle school on thus and such a day. I think it's a Thursday or Friday, you know. And, uh, and we've got to be at the school at a certain time. And make sure you're home. Because he worked, you know, he was all about keeping up with the Joneses. He was all about making the almighty dollar and she reminded him over and over and over and over again and the day came for my graduation and I was so excited and I was looking forward to this my mother and my dad are going to be my dad was an abusive son of a so and so he was a hard character but you know a kid wants his parents there on certain days and certain occasions and I sit there and looking at my watch where's my father Where's my father? He's nowhere to be found. Nowhere to be found. Finally, shortly before we had to leave the house, I had to call my grandmother, my mother's mother, and I said, Grandma, by any chance would you be free to come to my middle school graduation? I said, you know, they only give you two tickets, and my father never showed up. He never came home. So is there any chance you'd be interested in going? And bless her heart. My grandmother, her grandkids were always important to her. I'm going to tell you right now, she had her share of faults. We all do. But I'm going to tell you, my grandmother said, Oh, honey, of course I'll go. Of course I'll go. Sure. Come on by and get me, and, and I'll go. So we went and picked her up, and we went to my graduation, and at least Rose, I was able to graduate from eighth grade with my grandmother in the audience and with my mom there. Because my father had no interest in being there. He had things that were far more important to him. How many Christian dads are just like that? How many Christian mothers put their careers ahead of their children? How many Christian mothers put keeping up with the Joneses ahead of their families? I know mothers in the Pentecostal church who were so obsessed with wearing the finest and owning the finest and having the finest of everything that their marriages ultimately ended in divorce because their husband didn't quite keep up. He didn't quite do things the way that 
they thought it should be done. Children, I'm here to tell you today, don't stand here and tell me that you're a child of God, that you've been born again, born of the water, born of the Spirit. Don't stand here and tell me that you're heaven bound and ready to see Jesus when you have been converted, but you have not been transformed. In Romans chapter 7, verses 20 through through 20, uh, 22 through 25, Paul writes, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, in his body. He said, Warring against the law of what? Of my mind. And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the law of sin. See, here's the thing. If you don't experience a transformation of the mind, you've missed the whole boat. Let me tell you, my grandfather, my mother's dad, bless his heart, he was a believer. There wasn't a person on this planet who believed the gospel more passionately than my grandfather did. And he would witness to people. He would testify to people. When he was in the hospital one time, he actually led a man to the Lord that was in the hospital bed next to him. Now, my grandfather could cuss like a sailor's parrot. He had a horrible temper. He could be just kind of goofy and crazy sometimes. And he had some issues in his life. But you want to know something? Serving the law of God with your mind is the easy part. Oh my goodness. It's easier to serve God and to serve His ways and to serve His purposes and to think right than it is to act right. Am I telling the truth? Yeah, sure. Isn't it easier to think right than it is to act right? Mm -hmm. But you know what? If you've never been transformed, you're not even thinking right. What you going to do? Paul said, I serve the law of God with my mind, but in my members, in my body, I serve the law of sin. Am I telling the truth? You see, it's easier to think right than it is to do right. If that be the case, then i got news for you, children. People that can't even think right are in deep trouble. Yes. My Lord, have mercy. You see, a renewing of the mind is not optional. This is not something that is optional. This is not something you can uh, choose to partake of or prefer your way out of. It's actually easier to change our thinking than it is to change our behavior or our conduct. According to Paul, it's the inward man, the mind, that is more readily made to serve the will of God than even our bodies. Brother Gillum used to say to me years ago, I'll never forget, when I first went into the holiness movement, man, I'll tell you, I was so gung-ho about the dress code, you know, and the so-called standards and, and all the women and men looking just a certain way. Man, I mean, I was so tied up in that. And I look back now and I realize Brother Gillum must have looked at me and thought, good Lord have mercy, Chuck, you got some growing up to do, boy. But Brother Gillum used to tell me, getting folks to look and dress right is easy. Mm -hmm. He said, but try to get them to act right. Mm -hmm. Say, oh, you, you can get people to look holiness, 
but they can still be hateful. They can still be malicious. They can still hold a grudge. They can still seek revenge. Am I telling the truth? Oh, they can still be jealous. They can still envy. They can still lie like a rug. They can still commit every sin in the book. And the whole time they look the part. Because changing that part is so easy. All you've got to do, Tommy, is throw some stuff out of your closet and put some new stuff in. That's all it takes. And you change the way you dress. I'm going to tell you that lesson Brother Gillum taught me years ago helped me to understand changing our mind, allowing God to transform our mind is actually not so difficult. But the problem is we've got people who are perfectly satisfied with the way they think. That's it. Oh, no, no, Lord. No, no. Lord, you can, you can have my closet. I'll give you everything in my closet. I'll change everything I wear. Lord, I'll give you my jewelry box, and I'll never put on another stick of jewelry so long as I live. Lord, I'll give you my makeup, and I'll never put on another single stroke, uh, stroke of makeup again in my life. But don't touch the way I think. I like the way I think. Oh my goodness, have mercy. Ooh. I'm going to tell you, when you've had a renewal of the mind, it's a whole lot easier to stay humble. It's a whole lot easier to stay humble when your mind's been renewed. Because you know when you're thinking right and you're acting wrong. There have been times I've reacted to certain things a certain way, and I'll turn around and say to Tommy, Oh God, now I feel horrible. Now I feel terrible. Because I know I shouldn't have done that. I know I shouldn't have reacted like that. I know I shouldn't have had that. But by God, I ju it just come out of me, and I went and let my flesh rule instead of my spirit. And it happened, and oh boy. And I mean, and I'll walk around under a cloud for weeks or months over that issue. Yesterday, Tommy and I stopped at a buffet we hadn't eaten at in years. And, of course, you know, now with COVID restrictions beginning to be uh, lifted a little bit, and we still wear masks in public. We, everywhere we go, we wear masks. But we went ahead into this buffet, and I hadn't eaten at a buffet in a long time, and I've been doing real good about portion control, keeping my meals, you know, certain portion control. We went in there yesterday, and I don't know why, but I was starving. I mean to tell you, I was so hungry yesterday, I couldn't stand it. And I don't get that way a whole lot, you know. But I mean, I was hungry, Rose. My goodness, was I hungry. And I'm going to tell you, I loaded my plate up. I loaded it up once, and I ate. I loaded it up twice, and I ate, and I loaded up another plate, and I ate, and I mean, I sit there in that chair, and I'm breathing, you know, like I just ran a race, and I said to Tommy, I said, oh Lord, have mercy, I said, I'm so full, I can't hardly move, I said, my God, I haven't eaten like that in ages, I, 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 I was so hungry when I came in here today. I allowed myself to break my rule. I allowed myself to go against what I know to do. And instead of keeping my portions controlled, I just let myself go haywire. And I told him on the way home, I said, well, I'm going to be riding under the cloud of guilt for this meal now for weeks to come. I'm going to be riding under a cloud of guilt. Why? Because I knew better. Even though I acted one way, I knew in my mind that I ought to have acted a different way. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Oh, but you see, when you've had a renewed mind, it'll keep you humble. That's one problem we have with people in the church. If you look at what Paul said in our primary text today, he said in... Uh, in verse 2 he said be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind what that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God 
said, if you get a renewal of your mind, you'll be in a place to demonstrate and to show the world what is God's good and acceptable and perfect will. But then he said in verse 3, it's interesting that he went here after saying this. He immediately said, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think more highly than he of himself more highly than he ought to think. Paul, you were just talking about a renewal of your mind. You were just talking about being able to demonstrate and prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And in the very next breath you say, uh, don't think more of yourself than you ought to. You see, a renewal of the mind and humility work hand in hand. You know what? As a pastor who's been doing this for over 35 years, I'm going to tell you, it doesn't take me a whole lot of time to figure out which people in my church have been converted but not transformed. And I'm going to tell you a little secret, honey. There ain't a church on this planet that had not got a bunch of people in it who are converted but not transformed. Now, they still think the way they thought when they came into the church. They still think the way they thought when they went down to the altar to pray and to seek the Lord and to repent of their sins. They still think the way they thought before they went into the waters of baptism in Jesus' name for the remission of sin. They still think the way they thought before they received the baptism of the Holy Ghost because even though the Spirit of God came in, they wouldn't allow Him access to their mind. No, I'm going to think the way I want to think. I'm going to look at things the way I want to look at things. I've got my mind made up, Lord. Every room in this house, you're welcome to, except you're not allowed in the attic. Oh my goodness, do you follow me today? Paul said, don't think more highly of yourself than you are. How can you tell the difference between a believer who's been converted but not transformed it's easy as pie without fail they think more highly of themselves than they ought we've had people in this church over the last 20 years who came in and they bragged about their background. They bragged about how many years they've been in the Pentecostal church. They bragged about their experience with God. They bragged about things they had done. Am I telling the truth, Tommy? But you know what, Rose? Those were the same people that I could look at and in three seconds I could see they were converted, but they were not transformed. There was no humility there. Pride is the biggest enemy of God's people that exists. And when we allow our mind to be transformed, when we allow our mind to be renewed by the Holy Ghost, I'm going to tell you something, it'll keep you humble. And in keeping you humble, it'll keep pride at bay. You see, there's something good about being able to recognize that you've done something wrong. There's something good about being able to recognize that you could have done better. There's something good to be gleaned from being able to recognize that you're not always right. Mm -hmm. There's something good from that, folks. It helps to keep you humble. It helps to keep you from thinking more of yourself than you ought to. I've known Christians who thought they were the most spiritual things on the planet. And my God, they were convinced that they were just the most spiritual person in the church. And you know what? They were the same people that had secret sin in their life. That they thought the pastor didn't know about, but he did. He knew they had some demons that they were wrestling with. He knew they had some issues. You see, the Holy Ghost don't leave a pastor. If the pastor doing the way the pastor ought to be doing, the Spirit of God doesn't leave us blind to things, Rose, that we need to know about. It's kind of like raising kids. You know, sometimes your kids think that dad and mom aren't aware of your little... 
those little things you like to do when you're out of sight, you know, when you're not right in front of them. And you figure, well, I'm doing it. Mom ain't around to see me do it. And Dad ain't around to see me do it. So they don't know I do it. And Dad and Mom are sitting back there thinking, he, 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 he. Been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. I know exactly what it looks like when a teenager is doing this. And so am I telling the truth now? You know what I'm talking about. My little brother one time, we were attending a, an apostolic church in East Texas. And one time he disappeared after church. And I couldn't find him. I was looking for him everywhere. Couldn't find him. Finally, he showed up, and this little girl he kind of liked. He was a teenager, you know, about 13, something like that. And this girl he liked kind of was not too far behind him. I said, Dallas, where you been? Oh, I've been around. I, I don't know why you couldn't find me. I said, no, you, you didn't. I said, you was out hiding behind the church doing kissy face. Hmm. And boy, I mean to tell you, that kid, he'd give me a look like I could read mine. Scared him to death. Just about, just about give him a heart attack. I said, how would you know that? I said, I was 13 once. <laughs> I know how these things, you do follow what I'm telling you? I'm going to tell you something. There's a lot of stuff that we as pastors see and know and it has, doesn't have nothing to do with the Holy Ghost showing us nothing. It has to do with the fact we've been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. Listen, I'm so far from perfect, I can't even see perfect from where I live, Rose. I can't even see perfect from my back porch. That's how far away from perfect I live. I've done so many dumb, wrong things in my life that you don't want to come to my church and be trying to have little things in your life you're trying to hide from the preacher. Uh, no, I'm probably the wrong pastor to get with then because I've done so many stupid things and so many dumb things that I can see it a mile away. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Been there, done that. We've had more people in this church over the last 20 years who had been converted, but they were never transformed. They were going to think the way they wanted to think. They were going to look at things the way they wanted to work. look at things. They were going to see things the way they wanted to see things and it didn't matter what God or anybody else said or did. In Philippians 2, trying to move quickly now, 3 through 8, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. You know how many people come into churches and think they're smarter than the pastor? Mm. You know, you know how I know, Rose? Because I've been there, done it. Paul said, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, listen, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. How many Christians have experienced a transformation in their thinking that causes them to walk humbly and obediently before their God? As the Lord Jesus Christ Himself set the example, we have Christians today who can't, even go to a church that the Lord directs them to attend. Never mind submit themselves to death for the greater good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
We got people today argue with God, fight with God, ignore God, go another direction. God said, I want you to go to this church. I want you to move to this city. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. They'll fight God tooth and toenail, Rose. Jesus humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Where is that humility? Where is that spirit of servitude? When I was 16 years old, the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, I want you to move to Texas. I said, okay. You think I wasn't scared out of my mind? I was scared out of my wits. I had never so much as visited Texas. I had never been to Texas. I didn't know anything about Texas. Texas was 1,600 miles from my family. The only family I had in Texas was a great aunt and my cousins, her three kids, and she had a reputation of being a disciplinarian and a bulldog. Every time she came up north from Texas, the kids scattered because she was a harsh disciplinarian. When God told me to come to Texas, got news for you, I knew that the best route I could take was to obey. Am I telling the truth? If God tells you to do something, I'll bet you a million dollars He ain't telling you to do that to destroy you. He's telling you to do that to better you. There is something He has in store for you. I'm going to tell you the best thing in my life I ever did, ever in my life did, was come to Texas when I was 16 years old. Honest to God, I went through some wonderful experiences. I went through some terrible experiences. But it was still the best thing I ever did. I wound up being part of a church that I'd have never, ever, I'd have never been part of a church like it if I hadn't have come to Texas and become part of the Riverside Church of God. I wound up with a spiritual mentor, Brother J.T. Gillum, a marvelous, godly man, all full of the Holy Ghost, who believed in the power of God, who believed in the move of the Holy Ghost, who taught me and helped me to understand how to let God be God. So much out of coming to Texas. The Lord said, I'm bringing you there so I can teach you and train you for your ministry. You're going to preach faith, and if you're going to preach faith, you got to learn how to live by faith. My God. But we have Christians today who can't even go to the church the Lord tells them to go to. I know for a fact, because the Holy Ghost has told me, that God has spoken to people in this city and told them to come be a part of this church. And Rose, guess what? They'd rather go to a church that has a choir. They'd rather go to a church that has more people. They'd rather go to a church that has this program or that program. Because they don't know what God's trying to do here. They don't know not only what they're going to get from this experience, but they don't know what they may bring that we need them to bring. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you, a true transformation of the mind leads us to a life of service. Not a life in which we seek to be served. It teaches us to trust God's will and to have confidence in His plan and to submit to that will and to His direction. Romans chapter 9, 16 through 21, So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? In other words, who has not done God's will then in the end? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? He said, hey, it's up to the potter to decide what he wants to do with that lump of clay. If he wants to make what amounts to a bedpan or if he wants to make a beautiful vase to hold flowers. 
Mm -hmm. Whichever direction he wants to go in, that's his call. That's his decision to make. Rose, we got too many Christians today that aren't letting God be the potter. Hello now. They're not letting the Lord form them. They're not letting the Lord transform them. Most Christians today know nothing, nothing of walking in the Spirit. We walk in the pride of our own imaginations and ignore the direction and leading of the Holy Ghost in favor of our own leading. Again, many have been converted, but few have been transformed. We're called to experience transformation of the mind so that we too might have a mind that resembles the mind of Christ, which was a mind of humility and service. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. A mind of obedience. We're called to walk in humility, obedience. The greatest and most powerful enemy of the true spiritual transformation that God is trying to bring into our lives is pride. And pride is the precursor to what? Destruction. Pride is more destructive and more of an obstruction in our spiritual walk than any other spirit we can possess. Proverbs 11 and 2, when pride cometh, then cometh shame. But with the lowly, with the humble, is wisdom. Proverbs 13 and 10, only by pride cometh contention. But with the well advised is wisdom. You know what, when you got somebody leave the church, the next thing you know, they're causing all kinds of trouble and they're causing all kinds of grief and contention. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, according to the Word of God, the cause is pride. Proverbs 16 and 8, Pride goeth before destruction, and in haughty spirit before a fall. First Timothy 3, 2 through 6, trying to rush through. A bishop then must be blameless. A pastor must be blameless. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice. Why? Lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Pride is destructive. Pride can destroy. When you look at the listed sins of Sodom, in Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 49 and 50, pride is at the very top of the list. Ezekiel 16, 49 and 50, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride! First on the list. Fullness of bread and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. That means idolatrous conduct before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw good. Notice how Sodom's sins are listed as being those very things which are contrary to humility, service, and sacrifice. Did you notice that? Pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness was in her and her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. They were haughty and committed abomination. There was no, oh, there was no willingness in Sodom to act on behalf 
of the greater good. Sodom's sins were simply that they did not possess a transformed mind. And they walked with worldly thinking, worldly reasoning, and carnal motivations. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 through 3, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. Paul says to the Corinthians, he said, I couldn't talk to y'all like y'all were spiritual. But as unto carnal, he said, I had to talk to y'all like you were carnal. Why? Because they had a bunch of converts who had not yet had a transformed mind. Listen, even as unto babes in Christ, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Envying, strife, and division. What's the problem here? I'll tell you what the problem is. Paul's talking to a bunch of converts, but what he's not talking to is people who have transformed minds. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Do you understand me today? I'm almost done. James... Uh, I'm going to go to James chapter 1 in a moment. Carnality is demonstrated by far more than the dress code we embrace. Carnality is thinking and reasoning as the world thinks and reasons. I've pastored many people in the many years of my ministry. And as a pastor, I know good and well when I'm dealing with a Christian who has experienced conversion, but they have not experienced transformation. There are the church folks who can listen to the preaching and teaching. They can say amen and shout all over the building. But then they never seem to be able to implement what they've heard. Oh my goodness. That's who your folks are who have been converted but not transformed, Tommy. Well, they can sit there and shout and scream about everything you preach because they think more highly of themselves than they ought. See, they're amen in you because, oh, I'm there, brother. Oh, I, I've got all that. I've got all that. I've got all that. I've got all that. You never one time hear an old me coming out of them. My grandmother, Belle, they used to make fun of her. She was the amen corner at the church I grew up in. Uh, even when everybody else in the church got quiet and people didn't say amen like they used to, Grandma Bell was still there saying amen and making her voice heard. And you'd often hear her say amen and oh me brother, meaning yes sir I agree with you and oh Lord help me because that's an area I need to work on. These same people who have experience conversion but not experience transformation are hearers of the word but they're not doers of the word a transformed mind absorbs the word of God and then strives to live it a carnal mind hears the word of God and with a prideful spirit assumes they already have down pat what they've heard, so there's no need to strive to do it. Mm -hmm. mm. James chapter 1, 18 through 22, I'm almost done, I promise. Last scripture. Of his own will beget he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness. See what I said about pride being the biggest enemy of the church? See, if, if you've got pride in your spirit, then meekness is not going to be present. Mm -hmm. Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. And lastly, James writes, but be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. One who has been converted but not transformed will deceive themselves. They will convince themselves that they are something more than they really are, that their spirituality is greater than it really is. 
that they've achieved all level so that everything they hear they're never being challenged they're never being called to repentance they're never being called to change they're never being called to step up higher no because i'm already there i'm in my mind i'm already there james said you're deceiving your own self pride prevents transformation it also creates conflict and ultimately leads to destruction Pride causes believers to think more of themselves than they should, assuming they are something or possess something which they do not. Humility helps us to always receive the Word of God as we never assume that we have an all-down path right. and we're open to the constructive, transforming Word of the Lord. Am I telling the truth today? Yes. God has not called us children today to merely be converted, but He has called us to be transformed. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen.